everyone has their unique skill set and unique selling point, right? Especially if you're like already like a really strong rank player, like just be aware of your strengths and weaknesses. You can't be good at everything, but you know, excel at the things that you're good at and show up your weaknesses. But like, I feel like a lot of players just aren't that aware of what mm. their strengths and weaknesses are. You don't need to be checking every single box. You don't need to be God at absolutely everything. You just need to be very aware of what you do bring to the team because then you can sell yourself that way. Hey guys, my name is Aplox and I'm a professional Valorant coach. This series of podcasts is aimed at bringing knowledge to aspiring professional players in the Valorant scene and the wider esports scene. We talk to professional coaches, professional players, performance coaches, people that work in organisations to bring you the value that you need to become a professional player. Today I'm talking to Sentinel's assistant coach, Drew Spark. Drew Spark is a very experienced coach, having worked previously in the Rainbow Six scene at the highest level of play and now working in Valorant. He's going to tell us all about the kind of things that you need to know to play on some of the highest performing teams of the world, what it's like to be on a team with so many high profile players, working with players like Tens at the absolute top of their game and also some of the, some of the best players from the South American scene. So much value in this episode, as always, sit back, relax and enjoy. Um, so, how do you're 29, right? I'm 29 this 20, year. You, this year, now. yes. So, you're 28, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you would have been the, the school year above me, I think. Um, yeah, how does a 20, 28 year old Scottish Rainbow Six analyst end up being the assistant coach on one of the best Valorant teams in the world? Uh... How does how does that happen? <laughs> right place, right time. Um, I mean, if you want the full timeline, um, I didn't full send it into like I, I was I was always doing a lot of coaching stuff growing up um, in like sports. And then my degree was in music with a focus in tuition as well. Um, okay. And having an interest in games, but always being like dog shit. I don't know if I can swear, but yeah, of course you can. <laughs> yeah. I was I was never I was never good enough to play games to be competitive, but um like when i got like my sports injury and um i ended up playing a, a little bit more games because i was just sat my ass all day um i yeah i like fell in love immediately with the idea of like going on to game battles or you know just playing anything competitive even if it's mm -hmm. just like the in-game rank mode but um despite that i wasn't very good um so when i came across esports i immediately um took a liking to the idea of, you know, like more analysis based stuff, more coaching based stuff, but definitely more on the analysis side initially. Um, mm -hmm. But then gradually I started to want to explore working with teams a little bit more. And eventually um, I get sent like this tweet from my friend about this guy looking for a, an analyst for a challenger league position in rainbow six. And he had to literally like force me to like apply for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, which I'm glad he did because I got the position. It was with uh, another fellow Brit. Uh, his name's Bryser, and um, yeah, like the the the, the score was basically we were in Challenger League. We didn't have an organization, so we weren't getting what's, paid. What's the Challenger League equivalent of in Valorant? It's it's basically just Challenger League. It's it's the the level before. So you have Challenger League and you have Pro League, and in Pro League, that's where you're getting like skin revenue. You're getting good salaries. Um, okay. Challenger League, similar to Valorant right now, is not the most supported. Um, you don't always have teams with representation and like getting paid, so you get a lot of people with like part-time jobs, or they're in school, or they're just, you know, like they're, they're making it work in, in yeah. their way. And same with the coaches as well. And at this time, this was like, um, this was during COVID. So I had moved back in with my parents. Um, I'd like literally planned to move to England and then COVID hit and it just derailed everything. So I was literally living on my parents' sofa. Um, mm. And because it was a North American team and I was in Scotland, I was literally waking up at like 6, 7 p.m. earliest and then working throughout the night. And then, yeah, like going to sleep in the morning it, it, and just sleeping throughout the day. So it was, it was like a weird time. I had like no vitamin D at all. <laughs> that was like the esports dream. <laughs> yeah. 
it was it, it was pretty wild and I, I remember saying to my parents who have always been like fully backing of like my career choices um i i said to them i said look i'm i'm doing this i'm really passionate about it and um if we make pro league because you could get there on merit as well there was like a promotion yeah. relegation so yeah. i say if we if we win challenger league which it looks like we're we have we a, a good chance of doing um and we win a promotion game we have more chances to secure a sponsorship and if we do i stand to make like a couple of thousand a month doing this mm -hmm. um which would be really good and they were just like yeah like you know you carry on and um I, I said to them, I said, if, I, if I'm not like signed by October, this was like maybe like summertime at this point, um, I'll like make this a lower priority and obviously like figure out in a COVID world where to get a job in the middle of mountains. Um, so, um, yeah, but <laughs> as a music I ended teacher, up, <laughs> it's, it's exactly like, as you yeah. can imagine, like my, my music stuff was completely like just destroyed by COVID. Yeah. So, mm. um, that kind of sucks, but, um, so yeah, uh, to to kind of shorten the story a little bit, um, one of my Challenger League players got promoted to, like, he got picked up by a pro league team called E United, and um, the at the time they were going through a coaching change, so their assistant coach um, became the head coach, and he was looking for an analyst, and uh, the the player that I'd worked with, his name's Rexon, um, still currently a top player in that game, um, right now. Uh, he he basically just said, "Hey, like this guy was really good with us. You should try him out." And I ended up in the United, my first salaried position. Um, e United ended up dipping immediately, like a, a just typical esports stuff. Like one day you're fine, next day you're dropped. Um, I ended up working with the world champions for a few months, uh, Space Station Gaming, which was a massive resume builder. Um, and then I ended up on Exit eventually. Um, who you may know from Valorant, but they were in Rainbow Six as well at the time. We had a really bad year. Like I, it, it could not have gone worse. I don't think um, we were like bottom of the tables. We ended up, um, we ended up in like the relegation spot, and then we got O three in the relegation game um, to be sent to challenges. And during this time, I'd like built a good rapport with Psycho the Valorant head coach of Exit at the time. And it ended up working in my favor because he was, after like a year solo coaching, he was looking to expand and bring on um, an analyst to help him. And he was obviously very familiar with my work. And he basically said to Marco, who was the CEO at the time, now the CEO of M80, and obviously those two are working together now uh, under M80. Um, Marco came to me one day, he was like, all right, um, we're going to rebuild the Rainbow Six project. Um, so you've got two options. You can either stay for this rebuild. Um, you could even head coach it if you like. Um, or we could bring in another coach and we can, we can go from there. Or you could join Psycho on the Valorant team. And I was immediately like, you cannot give, like that is, that is like the most lopsided 50-50 of, of all time. <laughs> and like, I just told him immediately. I was like, if you're offering me, offering me a, the chance to go to Valorant, I'm going to Valorant immediately. Like it's, it was, it was a no-brainer. Um, so yeah, I joined Exet around the same time as Cryocells. Um, so like at the end of, uh, 2022 going into 2023, no, 2021 going into 2022. Mm. Sorry. We had a whole year of Exet. Uh, we did really well at Champions. In fact, we had a really good year overall. Like it was you know, a complete uptrend throughout the year. Yeah. Um, culminating in a you know a fifth place at Champs. Um, and for Psycho, he was really good at balancing building a brand as well as obviously backing up with results. And it put him on Sentinels radar immediately. And when he got the Sentinels position, he immediately was like, "I want to bring Drew across." He's my he's my analyst. He's been helping me out, and I'm on the team. So, the team was myself, uh, Kaplan, as a strategic coach initially, and then um, obviously Psycho being the head coach, and that was that was the plan. And I'm you know a, a year and a couple of months later, I'm, I'm I'm still here working for the team. How's it been? Um, on Sentinels, it's been 
like no other position I've had in coaching, um, there's a lot of eyes on this team. Um, mm. the, the fan base is extremely passionate. Um, very large. Yeah. 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 It's very large, very passionate. So there's a lot of my, my approach to that in isolation has been like really different. I'm still not used to the idea of people knowing me, I guess. Um, I, I, I it's, I guess I've done a good job of being a little bit older and remembering what it was like before, um, you know, like things like Facebook and MySpace and whatnot, like mm -hmm. being a boomer, I, I can remember what it was like before, like everything was just 24 seven online. Um, and your circle was basically who you went to school with and, you know, like any like hobbies you did, family members, like friends of friends and stuff like that. But like now you can have, you could be like a public figure and know everything and give people as much access as you want into your life. Mm. Um, and I think I've done a good job of being able to separate virtual reality from reality. But at the same time, like it still feels weird when like I go to an event and like people are like, oh, I've been following you since like you were on like uh, Space Station and Rainbow. And I'm just there, like, why? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's there so, there is a small group of extremely passionate people, I think, in esports, right? It's, yeah, uh, um, it's a it's but, a small crowd. Definitely. Um, but the uh, come back to your question though, like the the role itself is is really fulfilling for me. Um, I've I've had like a a promotion throughout this year, uh, to taking on the assistant coach role. Um from my analyst role. And the reason that that's significant is because there were three coaches before and now there's two. So I've taken on a lot more workload. Um, I've taken on more challenges um, this last year as, as the season went on. Um, I've learned a lot. And honestly, like I'm, I'm really, I, I much prefer the, the, the cadence of my, my new role, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more fulfilling, a bit more hands-on. And um, yeah, like I just find it a lot more interesting to do day to day. I'm interested to know how your role has changed. You know, there's a lot of, in esports, there are a lot of different titles and they yeah. often mean different things to different people as well. It becomes a little, you know, uh, I, I, know I know people in, in, you know, in the VCT, in the Partnership League that have asked specifically for a job title because they know it will affect their p potential job prospects in the future not necessarily based on the work that they're actually doing, because like I said, there's kind of an argument to be made about, well, I'm this or I'm that, or I'm this, you know, does labeling me as that hinder me in some way. So what kind of things did you do when you were an analyst? How has your job changed? What was your day to day like then? What kind of things would you do? And what are they like now? Yeah. So when I was strictly considering myself a an analyst, um, rather than a coach per se, I was working a lot more with Mm. I guess like the, the the way I was used to sum it up to like the coaches I was working with was like it's it's your job to feel and it's my job to to find out basically. So it's it's about facilitating an environment for the coaches and the players to fully trust what's going on and they can be as emotional as possible. They can feel whatever they want to feel um and they can go about doing their job as they want to do. And I'm essentially there to fact check. Um, I'm also there to do a lot of the grunt work as well. Like um, if I need to work with the player individually on um, like maybe I need to like prepare them for an opponent or like a certain play style, or um, maybe I just need to give like some team preparation at large, like on, on our opponents, I would do stuff like that. I would do things like find lineups. I would do a lot of data tracking. Um, and do some investigative analysis that way as well. So those were like the kind of things I would do as like strictly an analyst. I'd be a little bit more hands off, I would say, and more just kind of acting as like an intermediary to the coach and kind of sitting down. Like the one thing I love doing, um, like regardless of my role, is like working around goals and attaching time limits to them and monitoring those. I think that's one thing that is a bit of a strength of mine. So naturally that kind of fit into more like kind of analyst stuff where we like sat down at the start of the week and I'm like, all right, what we want to work on um, and how can I help keep on top of this and, and monitor it in the background while 
you're focusing on the bigger picture. So it's yeah, it's a it's a very um it's 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 a role where you have to facilitate a lot um and give a lot of room to the coach and the players who essentially feel completely comfortable, but at the same time I can come in and, you know, confirm or deny like any sort of feelings or um, you know, opinions that they may have about the performance of the team. And how is it different now that you're assistant coach? What things are you so doing I'm... now that you weren't doing before? I mean, I'm doing all those things and more, essentially. I've just kind of cut out a lot of the things that are a little bit more superfluous. So, for example, I used to do a large amount of data tracking. And the reason I would do the, a large amount of data tracking is because while there would be goals that we're working on, it's sometimes good just to have a lot of background data um, to be able to pull off at a moment's notice. Um, for example, like let's say we're discussing the quality of our retakes. Like I could have a wealth of data from the last two weeks of practice that would be able to give some context of what's going on. Um, but these days, because I'm a little bit more limited on time, I'm relying a little bit more on third party resources to track a lot of those things. Mm. And I'm working, I'm, I'm a little bit more hands-on, I would say, with the players. Like I, I will um, take a little bit more charge of one-on-one uh, -on -one stuff, for example. Um, so like not just like kind of being like, oh, you know, you hit this up shot here, but you didn't hit it here. It's just more like kind of like actually trying to discover what does the player need to work on, on like a map to map basis, or even in like an agent to agent basis. Um, and just doing what I need to do to enable them to get to, you know, the, the level of performance that they, they want to be at. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to kind of hear this from behind the curtain. How is it to work with players that are, that are so high profile, right? I mean, I think obviously everyone tens is probably known by everyone around the world, right? Anyone that knows what Valorant is probably has heard of tens. Mm -hmm. What is it like to work with people like that is are they any different you know um there there are definitely certain things that are true with you know not just like tyson but uh, you know like uh like the brazilians for example like mm. they have an extremely passionate fan like the brazilian fan base is the most passionate fan base in the world like they are like crazy like in a good Latin way, generally but... <laughs> right it's the same in portugal and spain they... here yeah, they love their teams, they love their players, they love their champions as well. And we have two champions in our team. So like there will be times where I need to keep in mind that there is, you know, like the, the, there are a lot of fans that are putting a lot of extra pressure on our players and mm -hmm. it is affecting like, okay, so for example, like maybe um, this isn't like pertaining to any particular player, but like th th there could be like a, a, like a certain map or like a certain agent or like a combination of both that they don't feel very comfortable on. And a lot of that has just come from the public perception, um, not necessarily them being bad at what they're doing. Like me, me, like sometimes I just need to kind of break down this, you know, this impression that they've created for themselves because of their, their popularity and like the, you know, the fact that the community will respond to everything that they do. So for example, maybe they don't feel like they're comfortable on a map, but I can help them realize that actually they are performing a lot better than they think they are. They need to give themselves a little bit of a break, give themselves more credit, and we can actually sit down and kind of discover like, like why, why is it that you don't feel very comfortable with this? What can I keep an eye on to, to help you with this? And a lot of it is like positive affirmation to try and be like, hey, like you are doing this really well. Um, you know, keep working at it, keep working on this in your rank games and stuff. So it's, I'm not going to say it's like mental coaching, but like I do feel like a lot of that comes into it where I just kind of have to kind of cut the crap sometimes and just be like, hey, like you're doing completely fine. Or yes, you are doing not too great, but like let's work on it. Let's, let's figure it out. Um, but I, I, I think. I think the fact that there's just so many eyeballs in the players, it does definitely add a lot of extra pressure and it does, I, I guess, kind of cloud their judgment a little bit sometimes too. You think they feel that pressure? Yeah, of course. Do you I don't think, a... I don't think they feel like the pressure on stage. Like they're, they're all professionals and I think they, they handle in-game stuff really well. Um, but I, 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 I don't think, I think they would be lying. I, I would be lying too if, if I was to say that, you know, community pressure doesn't count for something. Mm. But it also has the benefit of having a crowd cheer for you is obviously a big boon when it comes to 
being on land too, right? It certainly goes the other way where you're the team that everyone's booing or not clapping for. Um, yeah. You know, it's a double-edged sword in, 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 yeah. in that sense. And I've been on both sides of that too. Um, when we were in Istanbul on exit, um, mm. we played Fnatic, who obviously had Alfie, Alfie the, yeah. you know, the home hero. And uh, not only did, I think a lot of people expected us to lose that match just because it's Fnatic and they've obviously, like, they've always been really good. Um, but we came in with, we definitely had a, a map pull edge in that match. And, like, we were just in form as well. And the, the crowd was silent. And there was, like, a moment where uh, Psycho was like, like, why so quiet kind of thing, like, to the camera. I like the... <laughs> The, the the stadium erupted. It was crazy. And then obviously we won and we got booed and everything. Like so but then on the other side we played um a hundred thieves um in LCQ uh, uh b- before champs of last year. And mm. um the like the crowd was like almost entirely on our side at, at one point and it was uh which which is crazy because it's a hundred thieves. Um Yeah. But yeah, but and I remember like when we won the match, I like looked down and was like, "Oh my god, this is like really surreal." Mm. Do you have a full time performance coach that works with the team? Uh, we do not. Um, yeah, like it's it's definitely something that um, like Kaplan in particular would be very interested in. He's got a psychology degree, and he is an extremely smart person. Um, uh, but. With us juggling multiple roles between us, it would be nice to have, um, you know, that performance thing. And, you know, it, it would be something that Sentinels would be interested in looking into, I think. Hmm. It's very interesting that as a leading organization, that isn't something that they have right now. Because it's been a common theme for me on this podcast to kind of recognize that we are coming into the performance era of esports where everyone can do everything right everyone can shoot like crazy everyone can play any strat people can play double duelist comps they can play double controller comps they can play fast they can play slow you know we're getting to the point where everyone could do all of the i don't want to say basic stuff but you know they can do everything that fundamentally you could do with the game and we're coming to a point where every tiny edge matters i think um i think having the performance coach is really important to have on the team um not just for the players as well, but for the coaches too. I, I think um, kind of similar to what I was saying about um, like the like h- how nice it is to be a little bit hands off sometimes. Like I, having the performance coach enables that to happen, where like they they're just focused on like one isolated piece of the puzzle, and sure, like they might be like there present in like practice just to observe what's going on, but they are not like an active voice where they are, you know, actively coaching the team or you know suggesting like changes and stuff like that. They're not like a part of that part of the process. So it, it's, it's really good for giving the players and the coaches like a place to go if you need like psychological help. <laughs> like it's, it, it doesn't which, have which to be as important. It doesn't have to be as bad as that, right? It's not just, it's not just a, I think it's a bit of a misconception that they're there to remedy problems, right? It's to, to stop problems before they happen in the first place, right? It's to work and to work with people to maximize and optimize their performance. That's why as a performance coach, right? It isn't just about, yeah. it isn't just about, fi- I think it's a big misconception, particularly with like tier two teams as well, that they're just there to put fires out. But if you've got lots of fires, you're probably doing something wrong in the first place, right? Yeah. Um, yeah you got to have a good foundation um, I, for, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. And like I said, it's just general optimization of, of kind of, of kind of what you're doing. And I think it's interesting to kind of see how that's, how that's going to change in the future. So did you do a lot of kind of numerical analysis and things kind of in your education before you kind of came into an analyst role, right? I, I, as, as a musician myself, and well, I mean, I kind of, I've done, a, I'm, I have a PhD in chemistry, right? But oh, wow. music was a real passion for me, right? And I was, I was a good musician and I can certainly see where there are kind of crossovers. I know a lot of people that are great, great mathematicians or kind of great with numbers, but also great with music. How much do you think your kind of education has given you skills that are useful that you have today? Um, I think, I don't think from a purely numerical standpoint, it's helped a lot. 
Um, and the reason I say that is because I think that a big misconception with analysis work is that it's just crunch loads and loads of numbers and numbers, just numbers, numbers, numbers every single day. And then, and, and that equals results. And I, I felt like a lot of people who want to take on the analyst role, like just have this, you know, this, um, this idea of, I'm just going to go run the numbers and then give it to my coaches and my players. And like, they're going to like figure out what to do with them. Like it's a lot more of a problem solving exercise. Mm. So to kind of like twist your question a little bit, like, do I think that my background in problem solving and, you know, being able to think on the fly and, uh, working with like different, um, demographics, you know, through like sports and music, yeah, that that's absolutely helped. And I think that that's been like a key to my, um, you know, I, I guess my longevity in, in, in this position. Mm. Um, but I, I don't think that you need like a strong knowledge of like numbers per se. Like you don't need to know how to do calculus to be an analyst. You don't have to know code. Um, you don't have to have a PhD in chemistry. Um, no. <laughs> although it is impressive if you do rock up to an interview with that. Um, so yeah, like, uh, I, I guess like I've just had more of a, um, what are the problems? How can I solve them approach rather than just, I'm going to collect a mass amount of data and, uh, just kind of hope that it's going to be useful. Uh, I've used this analogy before. It's like, I mean, you know, yourself, you do a science experiment, right? What do you start with? You start with the hypothesis and <clears throat> A lot of the time, the hypotheses are coming from the players or the coach, um, who are like, they're not like, oh, I felt like we're always missing our retakes. Wow, it's a death slam. <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> it's like, they're like, yeah, I, fe I feel like our retakes are bad. Or like, um, you know, it could be like an individual performance thing. Like, I feel like I'm not hitting my op shots on like the BCI map or whatever. And like, that's like a hypothesis. That's like an opinion. Mm. And... I guess my job is to conduct an experiment and in conducting an experiment, I collect data, I use sample sizes, I use context. Um, and the point of that experiment is to prove or disprove the hypothesis. And sure, like sometimes you might find some different things that are in there. And normally when I go through this process, um, it will lead on to something else. So if, for example, like, we feel like our retakes are bad and then I can go and do the analysis in it. And I noticed that not only are our retakes bad, but our alt management is also really awful. So like now we've started like that, you know, it's almost like a, a tree is like kind of branching out into different areas. Mm. And then I can decide how much I want to prioritize this newfound information that I found. Um, but like, it's a lot harder to do that if you're just starting with the numbers. Um, and, you, you know, just trying to start with the numbers and, and form an opinion based on the numbers. At that point, you're just leaning very closely into, like, really bad biases, I think. Um, you know, like, just, like, results-based analysis or just, like, mm. pure, like, rating analysis. And it's just, it's not very good, I don't think. But I think it's, no you're, numbers... You're essentially just looking at VLR numbers at that point and just going number bad equals performance bad. Numbers without context are nothing, right? The same is true. I mean, obviously, I, I do a lot of stuff with, with numbers. Numbers without context are totally meaningless, especially in, in, in my field, because they're affected by many other things, right? Just looking at someone's like kills or deaths is, is totally meaningless without the context surrounding that, right? If you didn't, for example, take into the fact that they were, you know, playing playing a particular agent, right? They were, they were playing Breach and they had 37 deaths, but they had 50 assists, you know, like, and you've forgotten that other context, like they're probably doing their job quite well. Yeah. It's uh, a lot of that context matters, right? And people often miss that when it comes to the numerical analysis. Yeah. I, I also I want to, just... yeah, you go ahead. Uh, if I, just like, cause I, I found this really interesting during last year, like that, like a, cause this will like tie this all really nicely together. So with uh, Zekin, um, our, our duelist, of course, um, I remember on Ascent, he was really struggling on entry. Um, like, as in, like, numerically, he was, like, 0-6 in an entry. And um, obviously, that's going to affect him psychologically. He's, like, he's not having a good game, um, especially for a player like him. Like, he's, he's one of those players where, like, if he gets, like, a 3K on pistol, it's over. Like, the map is over. Like, he will just take over. But there will be times where, like, he's struggling, and he'll just be like, oh, I just need that one round. And that when he gets that one round, like, he's... he's, he's ready to go and mm. and he's 
he's so mature for his age to the point where like he doesn't try to force it too much but like there are times where like i have to kind of you know try, try and like get him to just ignore like the tab key um for a little bit and realize that what he's doing is still valuable um in this mm. particular example he was he was getting bodied an entry it was on the scent a site which is obviously extremely hard it's, it's not a very easy map for entries to play um just because no. of just how defender set it is so mm. Um, but, but he was like passing incorrectly and he was being annoying in the smoke and he was just dying. Like it, it happens, but like the rest of his team was coming in and cleaning up and for the most part, win or lose, we were having good executes. Yeah. And the rest of his team were able to play off of his really strong entry. So even though the numbers didn't explain that he was doing good in entry, he actually was. And the reason that this was important is because halfway through that practice, he was trying to pass a different way. And even though he was successful in getting kills that way, he was we we were botching our XX because mm. he wasn't pathing the correct way, and therefore we didn't have the protocols in place to um, to react Report to him that. In the same and, way, yeah. yeah. And it also just wasn't optimal passing too, which meant that we were kind of getting clogged up in the choke a little bit. So yeah, like like you say, without the context, numbers are kind of meaningless, and it goes to it goes the other way too. Like you could have somebody who's dropping thirty kills and not having as big an impact as you may expect. So if you're a Reina baiting your teammates in ranked, yeah, you know, exactly. that's e it's easy to get go 30 and 15 and say, oh, look, I was MVP. I was doing so much. Yeah. And you had no impact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's, 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 it's really easy to, to make that mistake, right? I mean, I certainly, I, you know, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people that are purely ranked players. And it's a common misconception to say, oh, but just look at the scoreboard. I'm at the top of the scoreboard. Yeah. But that doesn't yeah. that doesn't mean that you're having impact. That doesn't mean you're it, having impact. In Rainbow Six, I used to ask <laughs> my players to unbind tab. Yeah. Um, I can't do that in Valorant because ultimate and economy information is is too important. Um, mm. But I I do kind of wish that there was some accessibility feature or something where you could turn off your KD, um, in the scoreboard, like customize your scoreboard a little bit. Um, because if you could, that'd be a game changer. Like you, you just would never look at your kills and deaths and whatnot. You would just focus purely on the economy, on the, the ultimates, like, um, you know, kind of where you're at in your game plan and just go from there. Mm. I think that would be super helpful for a lot of people. Right. And it circles back to that point of performance, right? Is actually a lot of it's just in our head. If we were all robots and just played the system that we had practiced, that we knew work worked and we had the systems and protocols in place to manage different scenarios you'd probably find that the team was much better right if you just played like a robot in that in that case and always you know just played to the played to the context that you're in you also brought up a really important point that, that i have to have to mention as well as about the scientific method right and a lot of people well you, you've explained exactly what it is right you have a hypothesis you test it and then you say whether the hypothesis is true or not and mm -hmm very few players or the vast majority of players who in my mind are you know not very good right the average player is silver right so they're generally not very performant in the grand scheme of things a little bit of the the scientific method could help a lot and the same is true no matter where you are on that kind of ranked spectrum right if you're if you're a radiant player and you you make it to radiant every act but you you can't simply don't find out how to to break the top 100 right Mm -hmm. You simply aren't conducting enough experiments and doing them in a controlled way. Because that's what it's about, right? I think in ranked, it's, it's tricky, though, because um, like the, this, the environment... The control variables are much yeah. fewer, right? Exactly. Like, it's, it's like pro players are blessed to be in a position where like they can essentially sandbox their environment and they, can, they, they have four of the teammates that are there to help them be the best player that they can, hopefully. Um, and therefore, like, there is a lot of opportunity for, you know, um, like space to be made. Um, if like someone needs to experiment with something, or like if they're struggling, they can get their teammates to help them. Like their teammates are at the very least aware that it's something that they're struggling with, and that they can, um, you know, help monitor it like passively as a teammate, and also um, do things to help, uh, you know, make their quality of life in the server. Um, you know that much better and then obviously they have a dedicated coaching staff who are there to you know monitor and watch their performances too which which takes a lot of the 
um, scientific methods away from the player itself as well. Mm -hmm. And and there are certain players who are very good at assessing their own play and watching their own thoughts. And there are other players who um, aren't very good at that. And that's where, like, you know, we make our money by supporting those players in particular to take them through that method and make sure Mm -hmm. that they're doing it the right way. Yeah, I mean, everyone... Everyone has their unique skill set and unique selling point, right? If you're maybe maybe you're not as good at that analytical method, but you might be the guy that every time it's a, a clutch, you turn up, right, and you can manage yourself really well in that situation. Or when the team's mode is mood is low, you're always the guy to be funny and to bring it up, right, and say, "Guys, low, we got this," right? There's for people listening to this, right, that are thinking of going pro. You don't have to be excellent at everything because it's simply not possible, right? You, you want to be good at everything if you want to be really good, but you want to be exceptional in those categories that are really going to make you stand out and you probably already have the natural incl- inclination to be that way, right? Like you as an analyst, right? Like you say, you you probably weren't going to be a professional player because you just simply weren't very good at it. But as an analyst, you've, you've clearly excelled as a, at that role, right? There are very few people that have made the career that you have in, in that time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I had no hope as a player. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think uh, I think another way to frame that as well is just, again, like if you're listening to this and you're trying to figure out, um, you know, what your next step is, especially if you're like already like a really strong ranked player, like it's it's more at the very least, just be aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Like mm. I feel like there's so many players that like we, we talk about, oh, like, you can't be good at everything, but, you know, excel at the things that you're good at and show up your weaknesses. But, like, I feel like a lot of players just aren't that aware of what mm. their strengths and weaknesses are. So, yeah, I think I think a lot of people would benefit from just, again, even if it's just ranked games, just, like, watching back some of their ranked games and let you just take on a notebook or, like, open up a document on your, on your second monitor and just be like, all right, what am I good at? Like, just actually just, just be, like, introspective for a second and think, what am I good at? What could I bring to a team what is consistent within my own performance and, and what is inconsistent? What am I weak at? And sure, like there are certain things that you need to work on to, you know, to, to get yourself to the base level to be a professional player. Um, but yeah, you don't need to be checking every single box. You don't need to be God at absolutely everything. You just need to be very aware of what you do bring to the team because then you can sell yourself that way. All about building that CV, right? And And I think quite reminiscent of your story and basically everyone i know is you need to be nice enough and know the right people yes uh networking is absolutely the key in in any walk of life and yeah you need to be able to present yourself well put yourself put your best foot forward and if you give a good first impression as well that will last with someone too so good good impressions are always important so um you never know when you're going to give someone the their first impression of you so mm. you know making sure that you're um you know putting your best foot forward at all times is is normally the key mm. i want to slide slightly change tact just based on the, the time that we have left and ask a slightly different question based on where we've been going what's the most challenging thing about your job hmm that's a good question. I've, uh, I think, I think the challenges change um, from team. Like every team is different. Um, so like, I feel like, I feel like I could give you a different answer for every single team I've been on. Um, whether mm-hmm. it be like a, you know, like a personnel thing or like like the task or the resources. Um, I think for me right now it's more just, um, ma- like I think managing expectations is the hardest thing on on this team. Um, because there's like a, yeah, like it, it's just kind of coming back to like what we were saying at the start where like there's the, the community perception is, is very strong and, and, and therefore, um, it's, it, that it, there's like this extra variable that I have to deal with on the daily when it comes to like players or like even like my, my you know, like my, my head coach in terms of, um, just like like the impression that the community is getting and also the, the and how that extends to like the organization and, and and stuff like that. So I I don't know. I've not given a very good answer to that, but um 
I don't know. I guess I'm just like, I'm at a stage where I feel very comfortable in my process at the very mm -hmm. least. Um, I feel very comfortable with my players and um, I love working with Kaplan too. Um, and I'm supported really well by Sentinels too. So in terms of like my resources and my team, I feel very comfortable. So uh, a lot of the challenges are more external now and like kind of thinking mm -hmm. about it's kind of like the, the bigger picture of being at Sentinels. So what about in the past? I mean, you, you've said you've struggled with these kind of things in, in different organizations. Maybe you can give some examples and and how you kind of overcome those kind of challenges because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will face similar things. Um, yeah, so like um, I think <laughs> I think one thing that I still struggle with from time to time um, but definitely struggled with a lot when I was coming up was just like um, feeling like validated in what I'm doing. Um, Imposter syndrome is something that is like impossible to avoid for almost anyone unless you're just hyper confident in, in what you're doing. And I, I feel like at sometimes, like maybe I'll, like I'll have a day where like I'm just not feeling on form. Like I'll, I don't know, like maybe I just didn't get enough sleep or something or like the, for some reason I'm just not feeling like in my element and you know, I'm like saying stuff and I'm like thinking, damn, like that was something dumb I just said, or, you know, like I made a mistake somewhere and I'm like wasting time. Like, like there, there are like bad days where that happens. And I, I think it's, again, like it kind of comes back to like that self-reflection. Like sometimes you just have to take a step back sometimes and just be like, like I, I am doing well or like, or like just like actually just objectively assessing like how well you're actually doing at like for that day or for that week or like even in like your position and then just kind of like thinking about ways to improve um again i kind of like botched that answer a little bit but yeah like it's in, imposter syndrome is it's definitely something that um i feel like every coach suffers from every now and then and i'm definitely no different mm -hmm. i think like you say it does depend as well i think if you're someone that tends to be more confident that's often a position that people that tend to be head coaches find themselves in right because you have to be that rock you have to believe you have to have conviction in what you're saying and what you believe in and your kind of like you say the kind of bigger picture the vision that you have for for the team and kind of how you want things to to look in the future um so it's Another, not all bad if you don't suffer with it for sure um to give like a more kind of like general challenge that i've had in the past is more just um like you have to in this role it's really important to adapt to um to your teammates and like there have been times where like i've like struggled to really connect with a player and a lot of the time it's just because they have like a way of learning or like a you know just like a way of like doing that they have a, like a way about that process that doesn't like completely align with my own process and for that reason we both have to you know give a little in order to to make that collaboration work um, and there's been a few players in the past where I've just really struggled to be able to get the best out of them with the resources that I can provide just because it's just not something that they gel with. So I've had to like adapt my teaching methods um, because they learn a different way. So um, something I always preach is like, it's, it's important to, it's important to be able to um, like di diversify your, your coaching methods um, and even if that means like just reading up or like learning about other coaching methods or like talking to other coaches, like I love talking to other coaches um, and just picking their brains on like their own process, their own method, because like, to me, that's valuable information. Like mm -hmm. may maybe it's not the same way that I would go about things, but like, I can respect that that is their method and it works for them and it works for their players too. And I, I will always keep that in mind whenever I'm working with someone new, I'm like, Oh, like, you know, this, this, I, I talked about this with another coach, like this could probably work. I'm going to go try this. And there's a lot of trial and error and there's a lot of like, you, it's, it's important to be able to like speak openly and honestly to, you know, like, again, like your co-coaches or your players about how we could best work together. Um, so yeah, like there's a lot of humility in that. It's, it's definitely not like a case of I'm the coach. This is how I do things. And you're all just going to have to like deal with it. Um, because this is the only way I do things. Like you, you're not going to be a successful coach doing things that way unless you only work with players that are completely okay with that method. And mm. it's in esports where things are always shifting around, that's just not possible. Mm. 
So how are you going to adapt and change coming into the next season, into next year? What have you learned from the last season yourself? Um, I mean, last season was a lot of lessons in terms of... Um, I, I feel like, for example, like Kaplan and I had not worked together coming into the year. And I feel like right now, like we're like, we've got a really good partnership going. I feel like I understand um, his flow of coaching really well to the point where I can take a lot of initiative and bounce off of him really well. Um, and same with the players too. Like, I mean, I've been working with Zach since my first day in Valorant as uh, Ekin. Mm -hmm. um, so he and I have got a good thing going. And it's the same with um, like Tyson, um, uh, Pankada Sassi as well. I've been working with them for a year now. Um, so for the new guys, um, John QT and Zelsus, I've been working with them this off season, and a lot of it has just been me trying to learn about these things that I'm talking about. Just like how how they like to learn, what their process is like, um, how do I need to flex around in order to to fit within that? Uh, and and I feel like I've gotten a good grasp so far. But those are two guys that I you know really want to focus on a little bit more especially since they're both like leadership figures in the team as well so it's very important for the IG on the coach um uh, the coaching staff to have a, a really strong connection um for for a multitude of reasons and yeah like so I, I want to be able to be um you know the the best element of sports staff for those two in particular hmm. so since you're managing managing your expectations for next year given like you say there there, there is a lot of pressure and i think mm -hmm. I, I recognize that must be incredibly challenging actually to to kind of have that many eyes on you what are your kind of goals you know when you sat down as a team and you said this is what we want to achieve this year what what did that conversation look like i mean the goal it, the, the goal is always champions um and i remember sassy framed this so well going into um, you know, the, the first year of Sentinels with him, he'd just come off a world championship and won it. And obviously we're going to look to him and Brian and be like, what worked for you? What was your mentality? What was your process? And the, 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 the goal is always to win champions. And if you keep that goal in mind, it will essentially allow you to manage expectations anyway, because like, you're not going to win champions tomorrow. It's just not, it's, like champions is at the end of the year so you need to take it step by step so regardless of whether you know, like let's say we go to madrid and we don't do well like that that's okay like our, our, our goal is to go to champions so um let me start this again so yeah so in terms of managing expectations for this next year like the goal is obviously to win champions um but we're also very aware that Winning is not an easy thing to do. Um, it's about the process. I think we've had a really good off season. Um, the the goal of this off season was to catch up in in many ways, make sure our synergy is good, figure out some stuff with roles and our map pool. And I feel like we're in a really good position going into the Madrid tournament. And obviously, going to Madrid is also like a a small goal of ours too. So the the goal would just be to continue the process. Um, make sure that we are continuing to do the system which is working in terms of improving our map pool and improving our play each day, getting 1% better each day. And uh, we can start to build towards our champions campaign because if you win champions, the rest of it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have two world champions on our team that went through a roller coaster of a year. They had, a, they had an event where they literally didn't win a game and went home. And then they come into champions and they're the, the best team by a mile and they win everything. So, yeah, I think it's important to have perspective um, and, yeah, and just, like, use the motivation of that long-term goal to, um, to, 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 to really build in these small steps along the way. If you get to Madrid, will any of your family come and watch? Um, I don't think so. Like, my family are very busy. Um, like, my mom's a, a full-time nurse and my dad does... A few different jobs, including working on like a nature reserve. So, um, I think it'd be tricky for them to just get up and go out to Madrid. But they have talked about coming out to LA. So mm -hmm. hopefully, I can get them in for a, a league game. That'd be really cool. Yeah, because I, I guess I had this 
this is more of a personal question i think from from my perspectives is how, how do you kind of manage being away from your from your family so much and, and also having a job that's so demanding you know particularly you know on your relationship how how do you kind of manage that i guess um it's it's kind of funny actually because i i put out like a i put out the generic happy new year tweet and in it i was kind of reflecting on the fact that i've not really had a good life balance this mm. last year I, i've kind of allowed work and living in uh los angeles to kind of consume me a little bit and mm. i find la like i i don't really enjoy living here if i'm being honest i love working here don't get me wrong but like living here is just so foreign to me compared to scotland where i can just like walk around and you know i don't have access to the same resources but i mm. i can at least walk around and like i'm out here in la i don't drive which is kind of troll and I just feel like I'm just living in my own bubble. And, yeah. and as a result, it, it, it becomes very easy just to get sucked into work and just do that 24-7. And I, I, I definitely have felt it, um, mm -hmm. you know, impact my personal life. So in terms of like how I manage being away, like I, I don't mind it at all. I've always been pretty independent and um, I'm enjoying the moment. Um, but I, I, I've been able to go back to see family a couple of times this year when we've gone to the event. So a big part of my motivation of, of going to events is not just the fact that we're going to an international and we could win it and everything that goes along with that um, in terms of work, but it's also an opportunity for me to, me to, make, a pit st uh, for me to make a pit stop um, home mm -hmm. as well on the way back. Like if we go to Madrid, I'm absolutely going back to the UK before LA, even just for a couple of days, because it's right there. I might as well. Yeah. We're pretty much at time now, so okay. I guess, is there any kind of advice that you would like to give to people that have the dream of doing esports as their full-time job? Um, okay, I have a couple of things to say to everyone. Um, the first one is always be ready to take opportunities. Um, I got to where I was um, from a mixture of you know hard work uh, at my craft um and a lot of luck um i was presented opportunities and i was ready to take them because i just had a portfolio ready i had my pitch ready um i i was ready to take the opportunities that came along and i feel like every single time that i've been taken onto a new job that has been an important thing like for example reaching out to that guy on twitter to go to join that challenger team like i i had like all of my statistics and stuff from like a discord league i was doing ready to go just to show him at a moment's notice and it and it impressed it was that first impression again like it it, it worked really well when i got promoted to e united it was the same thing like i had all of our work just cataloged and ready to go so being ready and having the cv in a portfolio is extremely important because you never know when an opportunity is going to come along um mm -hmm. and you have to yeah you have to be ready to take it you don't know when another one's coming along and a lot of this industry is networking well and being in the right place at the right time. Um, and yeah, and kind of like related to that, the, the other piece of advice I'd give is we kind of touched on it earlier, but like, I, I think it's important to not pigeonhole yourself too much. I think you need to be aware of what you bring to a team because it's not, it's not about, Oh, this team doesn't have an assistant coach or this team doesn't have a coach or an analyst or an IGL. And uh, like, I need to go fulfill this role because this, this box isn't ticked over here. Like, it's not about that at all. It's about building a team and making sure that you can cover all bases, shore up all the weaknesses. Um, and the only way that you can do that and pitch yourself to a team is by being fully aware of what you actually do bring to a team, being able to show evidence of that. Um, and, and yeah, like, sure, like sometimes that won't result in a position, but that's because it probably wasn't the right position for you in the first place um, or it, or like what they need isn't what you're looking for, but that's okay because like it's, it's the right way to go about getting a position in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of check stealers out here. There's a lot of snake sale salesmen. Like everyone's trying to sell each other on what they want. So be very aware of what you provide to a team. Do your best to stand out, but make sure you're doing it in a genuine. Mm. 
thank you so much for your time, Drew. If you want to shout out anyone or any kind of final thanks, then please, please do that. Um, shout out Sentinels. They've, um, uh, I've, I've been coaching for a while and this is obviously the, this, this is like a, a premier team and they s support and trust the work that I do. And, uh, yeah, um, I appreciate the people in my discord and the people who support as well. And of course, uh, to my family and my girlfriend too, for supporting me, uh, personally too. Yes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.